Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, kids and cubs. How are you doing today? <laughs> Welcome to the Daily Beaver Morning Show for, what's the date today? Tuesday, yes, Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, hey, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. We have a nibble for you today. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. But before we get into it, let's do the most important thing we do every morning here at the Beaver Lodge. Let's say hello to you, Mr. Grizzly, and ask you how's your mental health doing today. Well, good morning, Mr. Beaver. My mental health. It's, uh, I woke up at 3 a.m., so <laughs> it's probably not great right now. You know, one of the things about mental health, uh, to, to, to maintain it in, in a good and, and positive state is that you, you literally need to get enough rest. It, if you're not sleeping well, it affects every aspect of your life, of course, but your mental health, especially so. And this is something that's been well known for a long time, but it's seldom talked about when people talk about, you know, good mental health practices. Uh, for me, when I have a lack of sleep, that's what really triggers my anxiety. Uh, and of course, you know, not enough sleep, your depression kicks in. So I, I'm not, I'm not great today, but I'm not terrible. It's just not enough hours and in, in not enough rack time as, as the saying goes. And yeah. uh, hopefully tomorrow will be better. M maybe if I, maybe if, you know, if I, so Bridget brought some melatonin for me for nights when I'm having trouble. And yes. I'm like, okay, because I don't like to take melatonin, but occasionally, okay. But see, this morning I, I um, got up and I took my antidepressant. I took my Advil for my back pain. I took my vitamin C. And then when I thought well, I was grabbing vitamin B12, it turned out it was melatonin that I took. <laughs> this is going to make for a very interesting work day. <laughs> Boy, oh boy. Uh, goodbye, Grizzly. <laughs> I wrote more coffee. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, oh, I'm, yeah, doing really well. Um, okay. Short night as well for me, um, but good sleep uh, during it. So um, according to my APAP machine, there was only 0 0.2 incidents all night long, which is pretty darn good. So it's it's doing its thing. Then. It seems to be doing its thing, especially now that I got a stable location for it, where the hose doesn't just go flying and the, the back hose doesn't just go popping off the machine. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and we've actually got it set right, and I can put it back on the same way every night and don't have to fight with it all night long. Yeah, it's actually a pretty decent machine. Actually. Remember, keep it done up in the rear. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um <clears throat> Good morning to our kits, Kit Saucy, Kit Kendra, Kit Sean, Kit Cassie, Kit C, Jillian, Kit Elaine, Kit Tavi G, Kit James, hello my friend, Kit Vim, Kit Linda M, hello dear, so lovely to see you this morning, Kit, uh, Kit Tavi G, Kit Visual Sun joining us today, lovely, 
Hello. Kit Janet. Hello to you too. And who else do we have? And um, those are the ones I see popping up right now. And uh, we have uh, Kit Sean trying to start a new uh, hashtag called Spread the Beaver. I'm not going to. <laughs> not gonna touch it no, no. <laughs> ah, cheeky 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 i like it ah yes 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 and kit mohan hello mohan and family mm, lovely to see you my friends spread the beaver oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I love I mean, our audience <laughs> it's, it's, i mean it's it's a great play on words it is because it's exactly that, a play on words. <laughs> All right, kids and cubs. Um, in the news, there's lots of stuff going on. Um, number one, uh, get your tinfoil ready. Oh, what, what, what happened? Oh, there? yes. Oh, because there's lots going on. Well, first of all, we have uh, all the premiers seeming wanting to join in on the whole fact that, yes, something about Trudeau's electricity regulations that don't mm -hmm. start until 25 and are not fully in effect for another 11 years are the cause of all this electricity of stuff. Course. And then it seems that inflation numbers will be coming out today and they will be show that inflation has increased. That's the prediction from about 3.1 to 3.4 during December, which is going to do... The same thing for the conservatives as it did the last time it went up a bit for, for one month. Them claiming that all oh, Justin Trudeau's policies did it. And look at we're back in it again. Yes, and let's it, look at the rest of the world too. Can we can yes. we look at it, you know? Yes. And then today is the first day of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Oh, okay. So that should get all the um yeah. PP, I'm sure, or sorry. Pierre Polyev, I'm sure, will be losing his shit about it. I, yeah. When I'm prime minister, none of my members of parliament will be allowed to travel to a World Economic Forum. Really? But I'm going to make Canada the freest country in the world, as long as you do exactly what I tell you. Yep. So, yeah, we have inflation numbers potentially going up. We have World Economic Forum and a climate emergency at the same time where energy went down. So, yeah, brush up your tinfoil. Polish it real good. There's going to be a lot of BS over the next little while. Just so you know. Now, with regard to inflation, uh, people from Edward Jones, which is an investment bank, are saying that even though it's gone up now, we can probably expect it to go down to 2.5 by the end of the year. It's just not going to be a straight line. Um, so, oh, oh, and get ready for all those people, of course, uh, asking where's your global warming now, too. Mm -hmm. right? uh, throw that into the mix as well. Uh, so climate yeah, and then weather are two different things, but yeah. exactly, exactly. So two point two point five, Jake James, his latest poor name. <laughs> Polish it real good. Real good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's the funny thing. I didn't read it as Polish. I read it as Polish. Polish, me too. <laughs> Polish it real time. good. What? Oh, Polish. Polish. <laughs> Maybe it should so, be spelled P A W L I S H. Oh, Polish. Yes. Polish. Polish it. Yes. But I'm all right. I'm sure <laughs> Poland would like that. <laughs> so, um, yes, inflation is supposed to get down, they predict, to 2.5 by the end of this year. So it won't just be, a, it won't be a straight line, it'll be a bumpy path. Mm. And they are also putting out the expectation that as a result of that, the Bank of Canada will reduce its rates sometime in the second half of 2024. And then that will bring some stability and some certainty and some comfort to the market because there's a lot of people renewing over the next few years. And if they're saying that even a decrease of 1% in the Bank of Canada rate will allow people to make better and more informed decisions as to what they're going to do. So fingers crossed that that actually happens. Mm. However, even if the Bank of Canada rate goes down 1%, as we talked to you the other day, given the skyrocketing insurance rates, that'll probably gobble up all of that decrease and then some. Yay. All right. So that's the tinfoil stuff. Um, Mr. Grizzly, there were also some awards handed out recently. Yeah, I discovered that this morning. Yes, at the Emmy Awards, they got gotten pushed back and there's a show called the bear 
that won for best comedy. And it seems that there's a Canadian whose name is Maddie Matheson, who's on the show, who's an actual real life chef because it's a comedy that happens, takes place in a restaurant. He's the one that accepted the award for it being the best comedy. Well, I've, I started, so I'm not sure if it's, he created show. it. But. I, I don't know. I started to watch the show last week because I'd heard all these, I think they won a golden globe. One of the lead actors did the guy who plays the bear, I guess. I'm yeah. not sure. And so I started to watch it. It's on Disney. I think it's on Disney. It's one of them. I don't know. Uh, got about four to t- two episodes. I think I'm three episodes in and, and it's interesting, uh, different. It's certainly a comedy, but it's more, it's a dramedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of, um, angry things that happen. It's, it's an interesting program. I think it might, I think it's one of those slow burns where you need to see a few episodes to get into it. Kind of like Ted Lasso was, Okay. you know, Ted Lasso, I watched the first episode. That was interesting. Then I, but by episode four, I'm like, okay, I'm in. All right. The same thing with Shit's Creek. Yes. Shit's Creek was a slow burn. You needed yes. to watch five, six episodes to really get it. And a lot of folks who, who got hooked on Shit's Creek didn't do so until after the first season. Right. So, you know, it just, just, I think if I stick with it, I might, I might really enjoy it. I, it's one of those series where, okay, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm digging it. I'm not loving it, but I think I might. Unlike Game of Thrones, I watched, I think, three episodes and I'm like, there's, there's, there's a lot of incest in that program. I really don't need to be seeing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so there's the bear and said this uh, gentleman from uh, Canada who is a real life chef actually accepted the award, mm-hmm. which is kind of interesting. And um, then they had the primetime Emmys the other day, and I think they had the Golden... No, that's the primetime Emmys. Sorry, they had the Golden Globes the other that day. That was a week and, ago, I think. Yeah, and um, someone you like very much, Ali Wong. Yes. Yeah. Won for Best Actress in a Limited Series for something called... Um, Beef. Oh darn beef! Yeah, I was going to say feud, yeah. but that's FX. That's the FX series. Yeah, I, I did. I've watched. I haven't watched the entire series. Beef. I I watched a couple episodes, and then you know life gets in the way. We we're we're busy folks. Uh, my buddy uh, out in Calgary sent me a message. He's like, "Dude, you should really watch this. I think you really get it." And I started to watch it again, and and it's it's interesting. It deals with mental health. It uh, deals with the simplicities of life and the complications and how sometimes they can really push a person over the edge. It, it's really good. Uh, it's classified, I think, as a comedy. I guess it's definitely not slapstick. Uh, mm. I, I would put it into the same category as the bear, certainly a comedy, but it reflects a lot of real life situations that can throw people for a loop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's about, from what I gather, a road rage incident that just goes all wrong. Mm, yeah, all it does. wrong. <laughs> yeah, it does. Sometimes you gotta let it go, kids. <laughs> yeah, dramedy, probably. That's a good word for it. Dramedy, yeah. Yes. In the news, there is also some strike action. It seems that the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation is having a one day strike today because Mid-week. they're worried about class sizes. The education minister in Saskatchewan says that there are two pilot programs currently in the works that would address some of those issues, but they're starting a one-day strike. In Quebec, a lot of the strikes have started to resolve themselves there. Um, I think on, um, around December 22nd or something, there was a provisionally provisionary deal mm-hmm. uh, stricken with some of the unions. Uh, the Quebec one was, is, I don't want to say hard to follow, but it involved many unions. At one point, there was five unions together calling themselves the common front, and the government had to do a whole bunch of things with each and every one. But uh, it is resolving itself. But there were four hundred up to 400,000 employees that were affected by all those strikes uh, or involved in strike action in one way or another. So that's coming to a resolution but also the National Defense Unions. Uh, I, think, yeah, I think it is the National Defense Union that's called employees uh, in Ontario and Quebec. There's about 500 sort of support staff, recreation workers, kitchen staff. They're all going on strike as well starting uh, today. 
And for them, it's uh, wages and working conditions with the president of that union saying that many of them are working three and four jobs. So they would like a little bit more job security. So it seems that 2024 is a big continuation of 2023 in terms of year of the strike. People want better conditions. People don't want to have to work two, three jobs anymore. People want have the crazy expectation that if they're working full time, they should be able to have roof over their head and food in their belly, a little mm. extra over for a little dignity. Call people crazy. Yeah, and every time we use that word, people get upset. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I don't mean I, in that sense, right? I, I know. This I know. is per perfectly and totally completely reasonable expectations. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Of course, you would. Uh, you did see in the news where a uh, gentleman in Quebec who blamed wildfires on the government pled guilty to actually setting 14 himself. Yeah, or th 13 or something. 14. Uh, Paris, his name is, or something. Yes. Yeah. Brian Paré, the individual who propagated conspiracy theories against uh, uh, about forest fires being started intentionally as part of the New World Order plan by elites, he intends to plead guilty to setting forest fires. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this we've come full circle now, right? Because when they do something wrong, they generally say that there is a plant mm -hmm. from the left who yes. instigated that, that, or somebody from the government that instigated all of that, and that they're the victims. This time, someone actually started the fires mm -hmm. and then said, Oh, yeah, the government did it. Okay, and then you've got really, again, the usual suspects like Crybaby Caillou going, see, it wasn't climate change. And it's like, okay, who's going to explain to these fools that whether the fires were set by someone, whether they were caused by lightning, and at the time there was so much lightning. Mm-hmm that what happens after the fire gets ignited is kind of affected by climate change. Because everything is so dry. It, you know, some days you just, you do this. It's called the surrender cobra. You just do this. Because you, you, exasperation. I have a hard time believing, I just do, kids, that people, especially in the position that Crybaby Caillou are in, mm. where they're sort of running a business of some kind and they are actually that stupid. He's paid to be that stupid. Oh, yes, of course he is. Of course he is. That's his whole shtick. And when you look back on your life, kid, You are going to so fail that mirror test. <laughs> I just... No, but it's seriously... Unless you are stunted somehow, how do you look back when you're 50, 60? Grandpa, what was it like? What did you do for your life? I was a shit gibbon for pay. <laughs> You know, here's the thing. I, I don't think he'll ever come to that realization. In all honesty, I really don't. I don't believe he will. I don't believe he will. I, 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 ha I believe that he thinks he's doing the right thing for his pay. Whether he believes in what he's doing or not is irrelevant. He believes he's doing the right thing to get paid. And that's all he cares about is money. Mm. That's it. Mm. And obviously he wants some sort of power because... Why would you be stopping for such a horrible contingent of government individuals when literally they wouldn't even want you in their circle? So he's trying to get some sort of position within there. That's my take on it anyway. Mm -hmm. I could be way off base. It's happened. It will happen again. But, you know. I think he's just trying to get some sort of position with some government in, in some province, probably Alberta for the most part, if he continues to, to stump for 
the UCP and the conservative movement, the reform movement, I should say. Who knows? I could be way off base, but what what does anybody what do, what do you what do you what do the kids and cubs think about it? I'm curious. Yeah, me too. Me too. In not so great news, I heard this the other day and uh, hadn't had a chance to get to it, but today we do have the time. It appears that the Department of National Defense says that it's taking steps to improve training for staff at the military's Sexual Misconduct Support Center, acknowledging that men who report being abused have not always felt safe, secure, and supported. This is from the CBC. The federal government issued a notice late in December saying that it intends to award a sole source contract to an Ottawa-based company to provide personal training at the Sexual Misconduct Support and Resource Center. The center, quote, has a requirement for the provision of training on how to best support men affected by sexual misconduct, particularly those who have lived experience of sexual trauma. Men accounted for almost half of all new cases filed opened on claims of sexual misconduct in the military during the last official reporting period in 2022-2023. Now, I'm not actually surprised by that. I'm not surprised by that. What is surprising is that it's getting reported. That's the surprise to me. This is not the kind of gender equality we seek. No. Goodness, no. Goodness, no. D&D said that during that reporting period, 1,431 new cases were opened over 12 months. Of those, 645 identified as women and 528 identified as men. The remainder identified themselves as gender diverse or the gender remained unidentified. In previous years, men made up only about one-third of the new reported cases the department told the CBC News. The center's programs and services are meant to be inclusive and are open to everyone, regardless of gender, but officials acknowledge shortcomings. It is of prime importance that people feel safe, secure, and supported. Unfortunately, that hasn't always been the case for many people identifying as men who have been historically faced with stigma in both the heterosexual and LGBTQ2S plus communities, D&D said in a media statement. SMR, SMSRC understands that everyone can be affected by sexual misconduct and have designed all programming with this in mind. The department says it does not currently offer services tailored specifically to men, despite the fact that one-third prior to this of the cases being reported were being reported by men. There is nothing. Wow. They're only getting around to it now. That's troublesome. Yep. The company is in line... For the company in line for sole source contract is Men and Healing, an Ottawa-based psychotherapy firm. No dollar figure was attached to the solicitation, which was intended to give other interested companies the opportunity to demonstrate they could do the work. Charlotte duval Lantoine, a fellow with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, said D&D's admission that male victims of sexual misconduct have not been well served is significant. Last month, Statistics Canada reported that the percentage of men in the military who reported having been sexually assaulted was 2.5 times higher in 2022 than it was in 2018. Yeah. You know, again, I'm not surprised by the stats. I I am surprised by the amount of men that have come forward to report them because historically speaking, traditionally speaking, men just stay silent about it. Yep. The tide is changing. And I think it's because you've got so many young people in the military that have joined in the last 10, 15 years. And, they're uh, coming from a different, uh, different perspective. And, and what Christian is saying here in the chat, reporting ruins careers. Yeah. Source, nine-year career in the Canadian Air Force, or Canadian Armed Forces, I should say. Sorry, Canadian Armed Forces. And, yeah, traditionally, men, we just stayed silent about it. And we're talking about it now, including my generation, uh, and guys my age are, are finally coming forward after keeping silent about it. I, I think it's because the, the, the stigma that is um, attached to it, because you're a man, you're supposed to enjoy it. If a woman does it to you or now, if another man does it to you and you're, and you don't identify as gay or, or, you know, uh, part of the rainbow community because gay by whatever the case may be, mm-hmm. there's like, well, you should probably enjoy it. No unwanted touch is unwanted period. And if it comes from a, a, a superior officer, 
person mm. or a higher ranking individual or even a coworker who, who, you know, it's just, that's your job. You, you don't want that at your job, period. Nobody does. So it is, again, I'm, I'm not surprised at the stats. I'm just surprised that men are coming forward. I'm, I'm glad men are coming forward because mm -hmm. it, it, it focuses the spotlight on something that has been happening forever and was never talked about. Yeah. Like would, never talked about. Yeah. It would be interesting to s look back on it at some point to see how much Me Too gave men the confidence to be able to come out mm -hmm. and do it as well. Given the reception, uh, Me Too was very, 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 very well supported by the public. We know that men tend to underreport, said Duval Antoine. She called for more research to determine whether the reported increase was driven by heightened awareness of sexual misconduct by an actual or by an actual spike in the number of assaults. She said it's not surprising that men in the military reporting sexual misconduct generally don't feel safe or supported. Mm -hmm. Quote, when you look at such a masculine culture as the Canadian Armed Forces, you will tend to see that sexual assaults towards men are not really accepted, especially if the perpetrator is a woman, she said. It is not at all surprising that you see this type of situation where men are not being understood or not being listened to or even altogether being dismissed. Mm -hmm. Duval Antoine said that while women undeniably are more likely to face sexual misconduct in the military, an unconscious bias, an assumption that men are the abusers and women are exclusively the victims, is just starting to be recognized. She noted that more than 40% of the complaints taking part in the recent class action lawsuits against the federal government over sexual misconduct in the armed forces were men. Why didn't we not hear about that then? Mm -hmm. We have just been waking up to the issue, Duval Antoine says. D&D says that while the SMR, SMSRC does not have specific programs for men, it's funding 32 projects in the community nonprofit sector across the country. Quote, most of the funded projects provide services to those who identify as men, though some of them have projects uniquely for those who identify as women, the department said. And I could understand that. Mm -hmm as well so that's kind of heavy, heavy. <laughs> to start uh but yeah uh, i'm glad that it's being reported yes and i'm glad it's being talked about and discussed but it's it's wow well i'm just i'm surprised that so many men are coming forward i'm i'm glad they are well i think this was a critical thing that needed to happen because mm -hmm. if the if we're working with the bias that most of the victims are women and the perpetrators are exclusively men and there's no acknowledgement of the men who are suffering the abuse mm -hmm. and yes potentially at the hands of women but given you know the ranks of the military have so many more men most likely at the hands of other men mm -hmm. oh yes yeah. um, it's a power thing right it's right it's, it's rarely a sexual thing and almost right. always a power thing. Right. So how do you stop incidents of sexual assault and sexual misconduct and harassment against women if the men are also doing it to men and men are saying nothing? Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's a tough one. Right. It's basically it's essentially handing a permission slip. The silence. Yeah. So it's, it's good. It's good. This is a, it's terrible that it happened. It's good that, that it's, it's being sad. reported and that the light is being shone on it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Cause it's the only way to get it to stop because if, you know, like I said, if it continues to be permitted against one group while you're trying to eradicate it with another, the people who are abusers just shift targets. Mm -hmm. That's it. it it's and it a keeps happening. It's it's a real thing, and somebody once said, "Oh, you're one of those men's rights advocates." And I'm like, "No, I'm a human rights advocate." If men are being abused, whether it's by women or other men, or position somebody in a position of power, it's abuse is abuse is abuse. Period. Period. So if I'm sticking up for a man who's been abused, just as I would stick up for a woman who's been abused, suddenly I get labeled a men's rights. You know, and, and you know that movement I'm talking about, the yes. Mental group. Yeah. I'm like, no, that what the, how does one have to do with the other? Somebody has been abused. It's horrible. Let's speak up for that person and change things so that they don't have to go through that. 
But suddenly I get labeled a men's rights. I'm like, fine, call me whatever you want. I don't care. I know who I am. Mm -hmm. My friends, family, loved ones, they know who I am. The kids and cubs, I think you have a pretty good idea of who I am as a person. So, yep. you know. <laughs> Lots of good comments in the chat here from people who have uh, military experience as well. Well, something that doesn't, uh, yes, I did notice that too. Something that oftentimes is not discussed is emotional abuse, mm -hmm. not just physical and sexual mm -hmm. abuse. Physical abuse, you know, is one thing. Sexual abuse is a completely other thing, but emotional abuse is really bad because there's no scars to show. Mm -hmm. Much like sexual abuse in many cases, there's no scars to show, but... Uh, it's all relative. They're all intertwined, if you will. And with emotional abuse, it can affect your psyche in different ways because you can try and talk to somebody about it. But because, well, no, everything looks good from where I stand. Yeah, I know it does, but you're not in the middle of this relationship. You're not in the middle of this work culture. You're not in the middle of it, so you don't know. And because I've not been physically assaulted, you can't see a bruise or a cut or a scar but it's on my soul. It's on my mind and it affects every aspect of a person's life. So abuse is abuse is abuse, whether it's physical, whether it's sexual or whether it's emotional, it's abuse and it, and it does terrible things to the human brain. Absolutely. And all trauma gets stored in the body. Yes, it does. It does. It absolutely does. And if you can't find a way to release that trauma, it can wreak havoc on aspects of your life you're not even aware of until all of a sudden one day it rears its ugly head. And often in ways that are not productive. Usually not productive, yeah. It's seldom productive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow, there's um, a lot of kids getting very real in the chat tonight, today, mm -hmm. this morning. I was going to say tonight, this morning. Uh, wow. Oh, from Jillian, this comment. My ex would yell, scold, and make accusations. He was never physically abusive. Emotional abuse is, uh, in many ways, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, anybody in the chat, I think emotional abuse can be far more psychologically detrimental to an individual than physical abuse. Mm -hmm. Because physical abuse, you can get... You know, you can you can heal from it. You can get medical attention. You can get psychological evaluations, and you have people who will come to your aid. But for emotional abuse, it's unseen. Mm -hmm. So, I think yep. I think it can take a, a, a heavier toll on a person. Mm -hmm. The relationship I had prior to my Beaver Sweetie uh, was that it was very emotionally and psychologically abusive. I was being gaslighted like crazy made the thought that I was the crazy one and you know the one with an attitude problem and fortunately I realized it early enough and you know the relationship ended but it had done such a number on me that I purposely remained single mm -hmm. for about three and a half years I did not go on a single date had no desire to I literally just said you know what I am my own boyfriend, thank you very much, because I am going to treat me the way that I like. I'm going to buy myself flowers. I could hold my own hand. I could have amazing conversations with myself in which I agree with myself and nobody contradicts me and insults me. Um, so, uh, and then I met my beaver sweetie and one of the things that I loved most about him is that he does not have an ounce of malice in his entire beautiful body. Yes, but, um, yeah, it's like, you know, when you've been with someone and, you know, you leave and you say, you know what? I'm not interested in seeing anybody, doing anybody, going on a date with anybody for the next three and a half years at least. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I understand you know, that. Yeah. I, I, I uh, you know, after my uh, previous relationship ended prior to meeting Bridget, uh, that was in 2017. And, uh, I, I had resigned myself to, I, it was, I got over the heartbreak very quickly because of the last, mm -hmm. one of the last things she ever said to me and I discovered, oh, you're a horrible human being. I'm mm -hmm. not going to get into it. I think I've talked, about, I've talked about it before, but I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of it today. But here's the thing. 
I had said to myself, okay, I'm, I'm not in a position emotionally to be with anybody right now. I need mm -hmm. to heal myself. Mm -hmm. and, and I worked on myself and I've, I'm still working on myself and I will for the rest of my life. But I, I had resigned myself prior to meeting Bridget. I had resigned myself to the fact that, okay, well, I'll just be alone. I won't be in a relationship. It's not going to happen for me. And that's okay. I'll still be able to date. I can still date. There's still women that find me oddly attractive for some reason. So I could still go on dates. But I had come to the conclusion that a relationship was just not in the cards for me. Well, you know, when you've right. resigned yourself to, you know, you surrender to whatever the fate brings you, fate brought me to Bridget. So, you know. It, and she's delightful. Yeah, I, I just can't look, man. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful and grateful every day for meeting her, and, and um, let's move on before I get emotional. I'm gonna uh, get a coffee. I gotta get a coffee. All right, all right. But yeah, so uh, men, women, boys, girls, doesn't matter the age. Even if you're a senior citizen, if you're in a situation like that where you're not being respected, speak up, say something. It's a uh, it's important. You have value and you have worth. And you should not expect anything less than that which it is you rightly, rightfully deserve. Shouldn't expect anything less and you shouldn't accept anything less. All right. Got a little heavy there and uh, a little personal. Didn't expect to, to go this way uh, on this conversation, but hey, I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did. It's kind of hard to segue out of this in a elegant manner. So let's not even attempt that. Let's just switch on, <laughs> switch it up because I'm not quite sure how to get that. Oh, well, actually, you know what? Here's uh, something that might be some good news. Yes, Kit Hugh, it needs to be discussed needs to be discussed and a lot of us can relate yes yeah yeah unfortunately there's too many of us at times that are not kind with each other which is one of the reasons why i keep on saying be kind to and gentle with yourself because if not you who right all right moving on to another subject here it seems that Remember that bus crash that happened in Manitoba? There was a whole bunch of seniors going to a casino. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they were crossing the Trans-Canada. Tragedy happened, affecting many, many, many families. It seems that Premier uh, Canoe and the Canoe government in Manitoba have been given some options as to what to do next. Uh, they were giving a series of three options, I believe. Uh, one of them was to um, to imp well options to improve safety at the intersection. One was creating a roundabout. One was widening the median to provide a safe space for vehicles to stop while crossing the highway, or a restricted crossing U-turn, or what's called an R, R cut. The R cut would not allow the vehicles to cross the highway directly. Rather, they would have to turn onto the highway and then use a U-turn lane. The province is now beginning a functional design study based on the three recommendations, and the premier said this would include public engagement and feedback. He's quoted as saying, "We're asking for your input and your advice as we try to choose between these three different scenarios and visions for the future of this intersection. At the end of that process, we intend to make sure that we are constructing the safest possible future vision for that intersection." I feel that the process is in good hands and is going in the right direction, said Dauphin Mayor David Bosiak. Our community will remember this forever. Some people, this has changed their life and will be a major significant event. The Premier had met with survivors and victims' families. And he said, to the family members and to the survivors, I want to acknowledge that we cannot make things right or make you whole, but we are going to work our hardest to ensure that something like this does not happen again and said that the province would be contributing money to help commemorate the victims of the crash. A lot of the families appeared to believe that this was very welcome news and that they very much supported the manner in which the premier did come to them and is dealing with this and is including them in the decision. So a tragedy 
um, that is leading to some good governance and um, people feeling seen and people feeling validated as their concerns are being addressed. This is what it's about. If you have public service, first and foremost on your mind, when you're the leader of a province or any jurisdiction, this is what it's about. This is how you do it. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Well, you say public service. I wanted to show something um, that's, well, I'm stammering. I don't mean to be doing that. From the Alliance to End Homelessness in Ottawa, there is a thing taking place this evening at uh, Carleton Dominion Chalmers. Ending homelessness is possible. Lessons from Finland. Join us for a conversation nice. with national leaders to learn about Finland's success in ending chronic homelessness and how Canada can do it. Featuring, of course, guests um, Sean Fraser, uh, Juha Kalia. I hope I said that correctly. He is the head of the International Affairs Y Foundation. Kaya Owenkowski, I hope I said that correctly, CEO of the Y Foundation. Jocelyn Formosa, CEO of the National Association of Friendship Centers. And Catherine Cullens, host of CBC Radio's The House. Dominion Chalmers, um, Carleton Dominion Chalmers, it was formerly a United Church, which was sold to Carleton University a few years back. Mm -hmm. uh, this takes place just around the corner from me at 8 p.m. this evening. I'm hoping I can make it there. I have to do an ASMR show this evening to make up for the one that I, I um, couldn't do last night due to a technical glitch on my part. And we're supposed to record at 9 p.m. So this is an extremely busy Tuesday for me. <laughs> mm, indeed. I'm glad that that's going on. Um, just to finish off uh, on the, the story uh, in Manitoba, it seems that collision data from roughly 10 years preceding this collision showed that there were 29 other crashes at that intersection in that time with almost half involving injury or death. Something the report says suggests high severity collision types are an issue at this location. Right angle crashes were the most common type with common factors, including failing to yield or leaving a stop sign before it's safe, which the report says suggests drivers on Highway 5 have a hard time assessing when it's safe to cross or turn onto the Trans Canada Highway. The report also identified a number of safety issues at the intersection, ranging from inconsistencies in signage to faded highway paint to lanes and shoulders slightly below current standards for width. So these are all things that hopefully will be addressed in this report. And uh, that last little bit was from the CBC. Okay. <sighs> Give me more of that peace, order, and good governance. No kidding. No kidding. Yeah, that's the stuff that we like to hear. Um, Cornerstone Housing for Women will be attending the homelessness uh, symposium tonight. I don't know what else to call it. Ending homelessness. Uh, lessons from Finland. I'm really going to try and make that tonight. I have to send a response and it's like, oof, I got to figure out my schedule. I don't, I won't be able to stay for the entire thing. So I know I can attend virtually, but I'd like to attend in person because it's, it's a two minute walk from my apartment. Um, there was something else I had here I wanted to share with you, but absolutely. I seem to have lost the feed. I don't know where it went. I'll see if I can find it again. My apologies. All sometimes, right. you know, sometimes I, I get caught up in, in, in all of the things that are happening and get a little bit lost. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Squirrel. All right. Squirrel. <laughs> um, if you happen to be living in Toronto, it also came out earlier this week that city staff recommended a 9% property tax increase in the city of Toronto with an additional 1.5% building levy for a total of 10.5%. As we know, we've reported on a few times, the city has face, is facing a $1.8 billion shortfall, which was one of the things that led to the big deal being done between Olivia Chow, the mayor, and Doug Ford to upload the Down Valley Parkway and, oh, I can't remember what the other one is off the top of my head, sorry. Um, to the federal, uh, to the provincial government in exchange for uh, a certain amount of money. And that, that also inv uh, involved bending, I believe it was, on Ontario on Place, I think it was. Could be, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, Mayor Chow said, I did not create this financial mess, but it needs to be fixed. We need to get the city back on track, which is true because 
unlike provinces and the federal government, municipal governments are not allowed, at least in Ontario, are not allowed to run deficits. Mm -hmm. They have to balance the budget every year. So um, in this case, property taxes are considered uh, at this time the only way because cities also have very limited tools in order to achieve that. Now, Toronto is not the only city or region in Canada that has proposed double-digit tax increases. Cities like Kamloops and British Columbia and Stratford and Ontario also have been doing it. Property tax on average went up 4.9% in 2023, which is the most since the highest increase since 1992. Vancouver, Saskatoon, and Calgary also have recently approved property tax increases. Residents of Halifax are also told that they can expect some property tax increases. Mayor Mike Savage there is saying, we don't want to put an undue burden on taxpayers, but this year is going to be very challenging. Um, Mayor Chow said the tax increase could be as high as 16.5% if Ottawa doesn't provide more shelter funding for asylum seekers. I have a feeling that some of that will come through because the federal government did move on it a little bit before, but they did not give as much as the city was requesting the first time around. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Time will tell. Time will tell. Indeed. So that's um, these potential increases in Toronto were outlined by Budget Chief Councillor Shelley Carroll at a news conference, I believe it was uh, Wednesday of last week. And uh, she said, it's no secret that this is going to be a challenging financial year. According to city staff, the property tax increase would cost the average household another $26.75 per month or about $320 annually and generate $380 million in additional revenue this year. Meanwhile, the city building levy would cost another $4.42 monthly, or about $53 per year. I feel strongly that we cannot keep kicking that can down the road. We need to get our city back on track, Carol said. So it seems getting our city on track is the media line that is being used in Toronto to uh, sort of brand this. Mm. In her remarks, Carol also cautioned that if the federal government does not come forward with $250 million in funding for refugee claimants in Toronto shelter system, the city will have no choice but to impose a 6% federal impacts levy, raising the total residential tax to 16.5%. And here, um, as the communication strategist, um, this, that's an interesting move to call it mm -hmm. a federal impacts levy. Interesting which it might be an interesting way to put a little bit of a squeeze on the federal government to get some of that money, because I'm pretty sure, given the big push that they've done on housing, that the last thing they want is in the city with the most populous... I can't finish that sentence because I started it correctly. <laughs> the city with the largest population... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Oh, you're gonna, you're gonna flounder there. You, that's the wrong word." I'm gonna, yeah. You saw it coming. The brick wall. Like, <laughs> ooh, didn't even need the binoculars for that one. That was like right in front of you. <laughs> and uh, a city on which the government really, really depends on if they wants to have a chance at winning the next election. That uh, having about. Three to six million people being told about a federal impacts levy as it adds six percent to your property tax bill is probably not going to be a winning yeah. move. So, a uh, smart play, hmm. smart play by Mayor Chow here on this one. I am optimistic, however, that the federal government will do something. Chow said on Wednesday afternoon, and here it gets is how you do it, right? Just carrot and a stick here, hmm. right? Well. If you don't give us the money, we might have to put something on the tax bill and, little, and label it a federal impacts levy. But I'm sure that the federal government will do something. Rather than, if we don't do it, and we know they're not going to do anything because they're in this and a that. Blah, it's blah, a subtler blah. way of playing the game. It's a much subtler mm -hmm. way of playing the game. She, you know? She's not doing a Daniel Smith and screaming or a Mo that we're not going to obey you. No, I think if you if you were to do something, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In an interview Thursday morning with CBC's Radio Metro Morning, Minister of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Mark Miller said his staff have been at the table with the city discussing further federal support. Quote, 
I think I can see something positive coming on the horizon. I can't guarantee the numbers that the mayor has put out, but it's certainly something that we're willing to work with on, work with the city on in a productive way in the next couple of months. Miller said that the cost figures provided to his ministry in private are at times different than those that fly about publicly. Quote, but we are certainly willing to meet them at a point that makes sense, and it's a question of sitting down and doing the hard work and looking at the numbers and what they're for. Asked about Shelley's warning of a federal impacts levy, Miller said responsibility for any municipal tax increase would fall squarely with Chow and her administration. Quote, anytime a city imposes a new tax, you can call it whatever you want, but it's still a city tax. It's not a federal tax. The decision-making process is for the mayor and her office to assume. So again, kindly, but without trying to, you know, again, say, yeah, I know I think we're going to be able to do something. May not be whatever you're, uh, the number you think it is, but I think we'll be able to do something. But if there's a raise in taxes, that's all you. <laughs> property taxes in Toronto are unbelievably low compared to the yeah. rest of the country. It's absurd. Yeah. And it's because each mayor didn't want to do anything about it. It was like, we're not going to raise taxes. We won't get reelected. Oh, yeah. But meanwhile, the city's broke and the infrastructure is crumbling. And developers keep building more and more properties upon an infrastructure that cannot support these developments. How do I know this? I have mm -hmm. friends in high places. I've got friends in low places too. I got friends who will just drop me a little note saying the electrical grid in Toronto is basically on the verge of collapse because there's too many attached, too many people attached to it and they don't have enough money to fix it. Yep. The same with the sanitation now, public, uh, the sewer system. It just, it can't support the amount of people that are suddenly thrust upon it because they've not spent the money on upgrading it in decades simply due to the fact that they didn't have the money to spend it on. Yeah, indeed. Now, here's some interesting uh, numbers here. If Toronto wanted to fully address this year's operating open, oh, sorry, if the city of Toronto wanted to fully address this year's opening pressure of almost 1.8 billion through taxes alone, it would need to increase property taxes by a whopping 42%, according to budget documents. That's how long previous mayors have let this problem accumulate. That's incredible. And it says right here in the article, like you said, Mr. Grizzly, the proposed hikes for this fiscal year come after more than a decade of mayors and council keeping property taxes increases at or around the rate of inflation, even in the face of successive warnings from high-level staff that demand for services in the growing city would eventually far outpace what could be funded through the existing tax base. The details of the proposed increases for 2024 could change in the coming weeks as city councillors debate the $17 billion budget. Under provincial strong mayor powers, Chow will also present her own budget proposal on February 1st. Interesting that Mayor Chow is going to make use of the strong mayor powers. That's a bit of a zig when I expected her yeah, to zag. But here's the best part. It's like, oops, Dougie's like, damn it. <laughs> Did it intend that for you? <laughs> when uh, I gave you stronger powers, I meant so that you could, you could help my developer buddies. I mean, I mean, you could build houses, build, we're building houses. When is somebody going to ask Doug which houses. house the province of Ontario has built? Every time he says, we're building houses. No, you're not. The province yeah. isn't building a damn thing. Developers are trying to, and they tend to yeah. whenever they can get a piece of property and build on it, but they won't be building on the green belt. And now, of course, yeah. we find out that uh, all the money that was spent on those pieces of property on the green belt, they're suing the province to get their money back because they're not allowed to develop on it, which means we're going to end up paying no matter what. And it looks like Highway 413 is not going to be going through because the pushback on that is massive. Yes. The pushback Good. is massive. People are like, no, absolutely not. Increase public transit, increase uh, rail uh, capacity, stop with building more roads. If you build it, they will come, and they do. You don't believe me? The busiest stretch of highway on planet Earth, planet Earth, documented, statistically statistically proven, is the 401 through the city of Toronto. The busiest stretch of highway on planet Earth. Not, not a city in China, not a city in India, and I've been to Delhi where the traffic is nonstop and it's not as busy as the 401 in Toronto. Fact. Hmm. Hmm. If you go. build it, they do come. Staff prepared, uh, staff prepared budget includes $600 million in cost savings and efficiencies while maintaining core services, so they claim, 
One service that would be eliminated is the city's window cleaning program, which uses specialized plows. Oh, sorry, windrow cleaning program, which uses specialized plows to clear the end of driveways in some parts of the city during major snowstorms. Staff said the program would be eliminated next winter and save the city $16 million annually. There's also $152 million in new investments proposed that include $82 million for shelters and housing, including the revised winter warming response plan. $30 $30 million for transit service, including hiring more TTC special constables. $20 million for community services, such as keeping some libraries open longer on weekends. And $19 million for public safety, including the citywide expansion of the crisis service and the council-endorsed hiring plan for fire and paramedic services. Meanwhile, the so-called new deal the city made with Premier Doug Ford's government late last year includes $382 million in provincial operating funding for this fiscal year. That agreement will also see Ontario upload the Gardner Expressway, that's the one Mm -hmm. you couldn't remember, and the Don Valley Parkway, and relieve $3 billion in capital pressure from the city over the next decade. The proposed budget also lays out $49.8 billion 10-year capital plan. Of that money, it's estimated that 52%, or $26 billion, will go towards State of Good Repair projects. The State of Good Repair backlog sits at about $10.6 billion and it's expected to balloon to $22.7 billion by 2033. In other words, neglect and pushing back stuff that needs to be done now to later mm. costs more in the long run and still needs to be done. So, um, good on Mayor Chow for trying to t- tackle this and take it on. But, you know, the job would have been much easier if the people that came before her had done their bit rather than taking the easy route. Well, <clears throat> well that's what, but that's what happens when leaves messes, and that's the same thing that we have on housing, mm-hmm. right? We've talked about this on the show where everybody's going, well, Trudeau, we left all that. No, no. Started back in the days of Mulroney. He was cutting. Mm-hmm. And then Chrissy Martin came in and we had the austerity budgets because we needed to get ourselves back on track to save the Canadian peso. That's what we were calling it back yes, then. I do remember that. And they did sweet F all. And then we had Harper come in that just mm. gutted whatever was remaining. Just completely gutted on anything affordability. And then when he did decide to fund something, it was tax incentives and you know, the way that they were spread out, it was like, there's 281% more for people that were middle and high income earner, earners than there were for people who needed affordable housing. That gutted it. Then this prime minister in 2000, uh, 2017 established the first national housing strategy in decades. decades. And we were led to believe he didn't until you, thankfully, and I'm going to use the term that certain group of people love to say all the time did the research you did a deep dive into it and it's like why how how come this never gets reported that they have a national housing program all we ever get is he failed he never followed through on that promise i'm like no actually he's been working on it since 2017 doing the things that the federal government can because remember the federal government only has responsibility for housing on reserve right. Correct. That's it. And maybe military bases. Yes. Uh, so that's changed by, by Sean Fraser, the Minister of Housing, just going directly to municipalities and handing them the money and, and getting contracts written and approved and getting construction projects underway. And of course, the province is, we need to build houses. We need to build houses. Okay, we're going to go to the municipality and build them. Not that way. Oh, my God. No, the money needs to filter through us. So you can send it to your donor buddies? Is that what you're saying? Is that, is that, is that what you're saying? Cause I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, indeed. Um, Mr. Grizzly, I think we have a show. Yeah, just about, I just have a couple of little things I wanted to add. In Please here. do. This is an interesting one for those who, uh, every now and then you'll hear Pierre Polyev say how broken Canada is. And yet, well, that's just really not the case. Uh, and here, here's why I'm going to show you a little factor here as, uh, uh, effective as uh, very, very recently. I don't know what the, f- the date. Uh, so this was in 2022. I don't have the latest date, but from U.S. News uh, in 2022, Canada was ranked the second overall country on planet Earth to live in as of mm-hmm. 2022. I don't have the latest stat on that, 
but that's, you know, that's pretty recent. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, there's this little thing. Where did it go? Um, uh, there we are. Uh, yeah, so most economically stable countries. Well, look at that. Let's just have a look at this document right here from the world of statistics. Uh, number one, Switzerland. Number two, UAE, which is not a surprise. And number three, oh, look at that, Canada. And they say, where's the USA? Oh, it's not in the top 10. But look who else is in the top 10. Germany, Sweden, Netherlands, Norway, Denmark. Huh. All these countries, Australia, have really strong social programs. Huh. Hmm. So if we're to believe what Pierre Polyev says and how, you know, all these taxes that we pay are damaging to us, how are we one of the most stable nations on earth? Mm -hmm. And I, I have one for you here, uh, Mr. Grizzly. If, um, hmm. let's see. I can show it to you here, I'll send you the link. But this is from World of Statistics, and this was out December 31st, 2023. It was a list of a whole bunch of countries and where people would want to move to from those countries. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, I have seen this. Let me just put this up on the screen here. It's interesting. So, there are two countries that stand out mm -hmm. on that list for where people want to go to. You'll just scroll down. So let's, let's see. see. Yeah, let's see. There's Canada and there's Canada. There's Canada, 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 uh, Canada, 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 Canada. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Uh huh. Ten of the entries are from Canada, and I believe eight are for Spain. One. Nowhere, no country has more than Canada of all these countries that were evaluated. So, and if Canadians had to go somewhere, yeah. they've chose Japan. Interesting. Where there is peace, order, and good government. <clears throat> yes. And people follow rules and like experts. Yeah. Interesting how that works, huh? huh. Who knew? Yeah. So people from France, from the UK, India, Pakistan, Belgium, Ireland, Qatar, South Africa and Nigeria all picked Canada. Well, that should tell you something right there, right? Wow. I'd like to uh, thank this morning. But we're broken, allegedly. This morning's uh, cup of uh, energy has been brought to, uh, brought to us by the Happy Goat Coffee Company. Uh, Columbia Popeyan, I think it's pronounced. It's a really great cup of coffee. Chocolate, nutty, good sweetness. It's a medium roast. Oftentimes I like uh, dark roast, but this medium roast is just, it's the right amount of mellow with the nice old burst of caffeine that's going to get me through the day. Mm. Yes, we are looking to I Happy Goat for sponsorship. <laughs> I did write to them. <laughs> well, I love their coffee. I love their attitude. I love their, uh, they're rainbow friendly. They're, they're good. It's a good company. And everybody I know who's worked for them says, no, it's a great place to work and local. They're, they're a national capital-based company here in Ottawa. And uh, you can go to their – they do have a website. I'll see if I can find it and put it up in the, in the chat. Great coffee. You can order their product online. So, you know, if, if you like it, if you want to help support a local company that uh, has, great, uh, has great coffee and, and a great reputation for how they treat their employees. And, oh, ethically sourced specialty coffee. It's not cheap. But it's also not the most expensive either. There are other coffees that I can get in, in local grocery stores that are quite a bit more expensive. So, you know, I could, there's one right here at the corner of Elgin and uh, I can't remember the name of the street. It used to be a, used to be a big uh, chain from Seattle and now it's a, now it's a happy goat. Mm, yes, indeed. And uh, before we go um, and we, before we close, we received a letter from a listener oh. yesterday that I would like to uh, address. Okay, please, please. Because um, there was some interesting comments in there, and I just wanted to oh, make sure that we were talking yes. about this. Yes. yes. So it's from uh, Kit Steve in Edmonton that wrote to us and said, Good morning. 
Your Edmonton encampment comments this morning on your podcast failed to mention that this all starts with our mayor, Amarjeet Sohi, who happens to be a former Liberal MP. Last week, he issued a state of emergency and demanded a meeting today, Monday. I thought, if this is an emergency, why are we still, why are we waiting till Monday? Turns out our mayor issued a statement from Hawaii and would not be back till Monday. Wow, these people freezing to death will just have to wait till Monday. Just a little balance would add to your credibility, unless you had no idea who our mayor is and what his previous life was, or was this just conveniently overlooked? This is first and foremost an Edmonton problem. The province has funded 1,700 shelter beds, and the province has no say in removing these encampments. This is done at the direction of the city administration. Regards, Steve, I will preserve the last name, Mm -hmm. Edmonton. Thank you for your letter, Steve. Actually, thank you. Uh, Thank you. I will not make assumptions mm-hmm. about your intent because it does come across potentially the word choice as in you wanting us to make sure that we slagged a liberal mm-hmm. along the way by having to mention that he's liberal MP and stating that we were not credible and that we lacked balance. I went back and listened to yesterday's show, and the portion of the show, which we talked about the encampments, we did not talk about anybody. We did not mention any no, names. We didn't. Federal, uh, federal, provincial, or municipal. And we did say specifically, or at least I did, that it would be really good if the city provided space at which there could be such an encampment, maybe some ice fishing tents, and that they used security and law enforcement to make sure that the people in those places were kept safe rather than using them to dismantle the camps. Now We were picking on Danny, but that was for the grid. For the electrical grid, exactly. So with due respect, I do not think that there was a lack of balance there. But your comment is well taken. We could have specifically Mm -hmm. said the mayor. I think this also comes from the fact that we mentioned that Danny was away out of town, out of province, while the grid was happening, and so was the mayor. That's quite fine. Very fair and valid point. Fair uh, fair and valid point. But the mayor did say that he wanted to have a meeting, and he did want to be there for it. Whereas the premier, she congratulated Albertans for doing a good job on reducing is when she didn't make the call herself. Right. She did not go to a camera herself, even from away, and say, hey, citizens of my province, the province I govern, could you please do this? Mm -hmm. They just had an emergency alert and let public servants do this. That's why we had to bring you comments from Leaf Solid rather than from anybody in the UCP. At least in Edmonton, the mayor himself. Mm -hmm made the comments from away. So everybody knew he was away. I, I do I do have a, a bit of an issue with the clearing of the encampments, though. Uh, the, oh, you know, I do. I think it, I do. that's it, a bad... It's a bad, bad move, move, period. It's a bad move. Period. And that yeah. is on the mayor. That is on the mayor. That, that is on the mayor. And truth be told, because we believe we'd be transparent, we do know that the mayor's Amarjeet Sohi, because we talked about him on previous shows, we do know that he happens to be a former liberal MP. He also happens to be a former liberal cabinet minister. Was he before that? Also mentioned, yes, we've also mentioned that he was, we know that he had former employment as a bus driver and was often laughed mm-hmm. at and disregarded as someone who couldn't know anything and couldn't have any use in public service based on his past job from the people who right now are trying to make you believe that Common people. They support the working man and common people, extraordinary people. The irony of that, right? It's just yes. Gripping. So, um, the other thing as well that you mentioned in this message is that this is first and foremost an Edmonton problem and that this is all, it starts with the city. It actually doesn't. Oh. Housing first starts with the provinces. Funding this. How much they're willing to fund shelters, how much they're willing to fund housing first, 
how much they're willing to do that job. It is the responsibility of the the, the funding. You're right. The, the financial, the fiduciary responsibility comes from the province. Yes. So um, the mayor, the fact that it was the mayor, the fact that it was, was not overlooked, it was not for lack of balance, it wasn't for tide anything, we didn't mention yeah. anyone. But when we did talk about it, we did place the responsibility at the city level for this one. Now, the provinces has funded 1,700 shelter beds, and according to the city of Edmonton, like we mentioned on the show, the only reason that they did break apart the encampments is because the city claimed that there was enough room and shelter. That is debatable. We've seen the lines, we've seen Bear Claw Patrol, and even though there are places in shelter, that doesn't mean that the conditions in those places of shelter are such that people want to stay right. there. Some shelters are not safe. We have Kit Dan here, who was often on the chat, who recently made a great intervention. Mm -hmm. I believe it was at Toronto City yes. Hall, stating that you know, from his personal experience, he stayed in many, many shelters, and some of them are well run, some of them are not. He, he look, we're, we're going to... At some point in time, we will do uh, a show that deals with this topic uh, from a first-hand lived experience. We'll bring Dan in, and he can regale us with his personal lived experience. This is something he, he, he will tell you. He was on the streets for 19 years. So if any, anybody's going to be able to tell you what it's like to do it, he can. Yeah. And there are people as well, as we mentioned, because of addiction and other issues that can't or won't follow the mm -hmm. rules of those shelters. And simply saying, well, we put up a shelter if you didn't want to take it, too bad, without providing a range of sh type of mm -hmm. shelter housing, something that could meet their needs. We do not do the game on this show, just for out of transparency, of trying to hide or soft pedal whose responsibility things nope. are. So maybe you're new to our show. Possibly, yeah. And you might assume that we're like others, but we're not. We don't do that. So we will not take personally the fact that there seems to be some suggestion in tone. This, And we may be misinterpreting it's that. It's entirely possible, yes. It, the written word, it's hard to, the nuance is lost, right? We don't have eye contact. We don't have inflection. We don't have voice. So we're not we're not it's approaching good. this from a, a defensive position or from a uh, position of malice. No, because there are some good comments mm -hmm. in there. Absolutely. Remember, also this show is off the cuff, mm -hmm. right? We're not scripting no, it. It's, so it's live, and when we make mistakes, and we do, we will we mm -hmm. will you know make amends for them. But I read your letter, and I went back and I listened to the show so that I would know specifically what it is that we said mm. so that I can respond. And I'm sure that if you go back and you listen, the section where we're talking about the encampments, we did not lay any responsibility at any other level but with the city. The fact that we did not mention specifically the mayor's name. Minor oversight, sure, yeah. Oversight or not oversight, I don't think it was necessarily necessary. It wouldn't necessarily have added or detracted anything from what it is that we were saying about the message about providing housing and the need to do it. And for other cities as well, to provide that type of housing, that type of shelter mm -hmm. or build barracks, for example, as you suggested, Mr. Grizzly. But we are happy to mention it on the show. Yes, the mayor of Edmonton is Amarjeet Sohi. And yes, he is a former Liberal MP, was a former Liberal cabinet mm -hmm. minister. I have no problem with mentioning that. We did not know that he was way out of town on vacation. You say that he is. We will take your mm -hmm. word for it. And we are sharing this news with the kids because we are transparent. Yes. But please do not make assumptions that we are not trying to provide balance or that we are trying to conveniently Omit. overlook things. It's not our no. style. It's not what we do. So thank you for bringing us some additional information. We're bringing you some additional information as well. Hopefully this is an exchange. Do not make the assumption 
that providing shelter is strictly a municipal thing. No, it's it's levels of government. That's not where it starts. No. That's not where it starts. It's where it ends, but it's not where it starts. It's where it ends. And they have the ultimate responsibility mm -hmm. for service delivery. Yes. That is true. And also don't make the assumption that just because some officials say that there, we have funded X number of shelter beds, mm. that all of those shelter beds are available on a certain day, or those shelter beds have been designed in such a way that the people who need the service can use the service were actually even designed with the needs of the service users in mind first. Because our friend Dan can tell you from personal experience that often these services are designed with very little consultation mm -hmm. with the community that will be most affected by the services that are being offered. Problems are usually a little more complicated and nuanced than saying it's just all one person or one level of government's fault. Yes. But thank you for the message. Thank you for the knowledge. You educated us. Hopefully we get to educate you too, and hopefully we keep growing together. And hopefully you will keep listening to the show. But it was an important letter, and we did want to address it and bring it on the show. And, and we do appreciate the input. Um, we yes. do appreciate the input, and we will never uh, go out of our way to belittle anybody because we don't do that. That's not who we are. So we're not doing that. So please don't take offense to this. Uh, we're just trying to get the facts straight and reflect that in our pro and, in our show. And explain to you how mm -hmm. we work and for everybody else listening because we don't necessarily quote everything. We don't necessarily cite everything every single time. We don't. Sometimes you have to have been following us for a while to know what we're referring to to something in the past and what we've talked about in the past. Sometimes if you just arrive, you don't know what came before, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. That's why sometimes we repeat things. If you've been listening to the show for a while, oh God, are they saying that again? They always say that. Well, because we have you know, people. People are joining and they need to be up to date on things, which is why I say, I've yeah. said this many times before and I'll say it again. I do that frequently. Because as new people come in, they need to get to know who we are and what we're all about and what we're trying to accomplish here. And what we're trying to accomplish is getting truth and facts to you, the Canadian people, so that you are well-informed enough to make an informed voting decision. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very, very important. All right. Mr. Grizzly, do we have a we show? Do indeed. All right. Kits and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. We hope that you enjoyed listening to us because we love making this for you. Now remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. And if you'd like not to miss a show, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl, you can go to our pod page. That's podpage.com slash the true North Eager Beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. Or you can scan that QR code that's right under my chin. And that way, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it will get directly to you. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can go to our True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page, which has crossed the 600 subscribers. Yay! 400 more. Had, <laughs> had somebody try to get into it, get into it with me yesterday on, uh, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you have no people watch your show, blah, blah, blah. Okay. It's like, mm -hmm. thank you. And again, it's like, Thank you for showing that you do not understand how our industry works, that we, you think we only you know, uh, broadcast on what platform, and, but thank you for your engagement. And then you know, a whole bunch of stuff about my race and, oh, of course. and, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, you know, this is bait. So thank Come you. It's like, oh, I'm supposed to react now with a, like a tweet of what baiting is. And then kept at it again. So then I put a tweet of somebody fishing with an arrow going like, this is you. And then... Appar uh, apparently, I perform oral sex on a really rich person in order to be able to keep this going. Oh. According to that person, yes. So all yes. the money I've spent to make this happen, you're getting paid for by performing oral sex on a rich person? It Bro, seems where's so. my cut? <laughs> <laughs> it seems so. That's okay. I didn't know I was that good at what I did. Um, and <laughs> 
I'm hey, not. if this beaver could live on blowjobs alone. <laughs> I'm not saying a damn thing. I just, yes, and then apparently then when I showed him the gif of the person fishing, it's sort of like, oh, so he's showing me your boyfriend and I just responded like with three dots, dot, dot, dot. And the person went, of course. Yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> I found some of the obnoxious but, comments that I get on the shorts I uh, just respond to. Thank you for your engagement. We really appreciate you driving our numbers up. Remember yeah. to like, share, and subscribe. Well, well like, share, and subscribe. Ah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but this person was really trying to make an effort to try and bait me into some type of thing. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to react now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like i don't know so yeah so thank you kiss and cubs please go to our apparently you know the fact that we only had 540 something subscribers was a sign and then he went to our apple podcast thing and said only 22 reviews wow you must be really making it big and it's like dude i'm not going to get into yeah. an argument with you about how big our we know what we do it's good enough for Thank us. you for your engagement. Remember to like, share, I don't and have to. Yes. I have nothing to prove to you, and I'm certainly not going to justify to you what our viewership is, and I certainly am not going to justify to you anything about my race. Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's like, I don't. I had another person one day that offered me a website and says, well, read all this website and tell me what you think about this. And it's like, oh, excuse me. You thought this, my Twitter feed was Burger King. You just get to belly up to my bar and place an yeah. order. <laughs> uh, don't work that way, honey. <laughs> the amount of <laughs> it's giving me homework. The amount of soliciting I get on a daily basis. To, uh, I looked at your YouTube channel and your SEO is not very good, and I can help you with that. And I'm like, uh huh. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, that, that's uh, nice. nice. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's like this guy was like trying to give me homework. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> busy enough as it is. Thank guess, you very much. Exactly. And he sends me to the same like some crackpot website you know 1100 scientists including one nobel laureate the lower nobel laureate was somebody in physics had nothing to do with climate change and the 1100 experts were like you know a whole bunch of different fields nothing having to do with climate change and it's like and as if like 1100 scientists was a lot in the entire mm -hmm. world where there are millions <laughs> but these 1100 say that climate change is not real so you should read this website top to bottom back to forth and it's like that, yeah. that that's anecdotal evidence number one number two most of the people aren't experts in that field and number three that's like saying well my grandfather smoked cigarettes till he was 99 okay well also the thing is like and who are you again <laughs> to like if neil degrasse tyson sent me a tweet saying you really need to read this website oh, okay that, like, yeah. you know yeah. yeah but um some guy that goes by not their own name and doesn't have their own picture and doesn't like, who are you to be giving me homework? When did I sign up for your class? I'm sorry. <laughs> so yeah, people try, people try. What can you say? Can't blame them from trying, mm -hmm. I guess. All right. So yes, please do go to our YouTube page like share and subscribe and if you would like to support us in other ways then our coffee page is there for you where you will find the eager beaver emergency hydration fund where our friends coffee and hot chocolate and guinness is good lad that one really oh, yeah. good lad and caesar mm -hmm, are waiting for us to be our staff to help us write and produce and deliver this show that you love if you can make a little contribution there, that would be very, very appreciated. Thank you for all that you do for us. Because democracy is something that you do, write those letters, particularly if you're in New Brunswick. Let your MLAs know that, uh, or candidates, that if they do anything to affect uh, transgender access to health care, that not only will you not vote for them, but you will make sure that all your friends don't and will mobilize and try to make their lives a hell during their campaign. That is usually very useful. Also, if you're in Ontario, write to ask where the hell Doug Ford is. If you're in Alberta, write to ask what the hell's going on with your electricity. 
lots of reasons to write to Dask for a meeting to give people a little bit of a performance review here. So you've been falling down on the job. So take matters into your own hands there. And if you have an opportunity, again, the hospitals are overflowing. Go get your shots. Please do. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver. This is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there. So please be kind to and gentle with yourself, Mr. Grizzly. Please, some words of wisdom. Get some rest. You're gonna need it. Mm -hmm. And Kit Cassie has some wisdom here. Spread some kindness today. Works for me. Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay, Mr. Grizzly, please roll the credits. One second, sir. You are listening to. A True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. For our Easter egg, uh, Kits and Cubs, a little more tennis news. Unfortunately, Gabriella Dabrowski did not like my Twitter feed. I went to look at it a little more closely. No, it was a fake. Dabrowski was spelt with two of course, eyes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a fake one. Yeah. yeah. It was a fake yeah, one. It happens. Uh, it happens. Oh, I thought I believed for half a for half a day. I believe for half yeah. a day. Uh, Felix Ogielia Sim won his first round in singles. So he goes to the second round along with Leilani Fernandez. Milos Raonic unfortunately had to withdraw uh, from his match, probably with an injury, uh, but he was playing one of the top 10 players in the world. Rebecca Marino uh, was on court when we were starting the show, but she too was playing one of the top 10 players in the world for her first round. So some pretty tough draws for Canadians mm -hmm. here at, uh, at the Australian Open. One other thing I'd like to mention about uh, Mr. Sohi, because I wanted to, I wanted to go check, just for full transparency, yes. from 2015 to 2018, he was the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities and 2018 to 2019, Minister of Natural Resources. So, and we're going to say it here, as Minister of Infrastructure and Communities for three years, and now Mayor of a community, and shelters and stuff of the like are infrastructure, mm. There's very little excuse for this not being handled. Agreed. By. So he better step up to the plate and get this fixed, uh, but quick. Mm -hmm. But again, he put his own face and his own voice to his call for that emergency meeting while he was away and not hiding mm -hmm. it. Compare and contrast with the premier. Fair point. All right. I got to go. I'm late. Right. I'll see you. See you.